Okay. Is this thing working? Okay, good morning everybody. Um, as introduced, my name is Jan Mitrovic. I'm working for a small company in, does this work? Yeah, it does. Uh, in uh, Germany, and I'm going to uh, give a talk about smart gas sensors for mobile applications. There is at the moment quite a huge interest in that area. So I will try to cover that more from an application point of view. So what kind of applications are there? What are the specific um, challenges that you're going to face if you want to put um, gas sensors into mobile phones or use them connected to mobile phones? Um, I will go through a couple of examples and provide you with some of the uh, challenges that we um, some of the challenges that we found um, during our work in that area. I will also show you some of the current um, um, devices that are coming onto the market. So it's more, you know, an overview of what's done at the moment, uh, what um, uh, what ex um, experience do we have when we try to use sensors in that quite challenging environment. Um, So just a few words on, on JLM Innovation because most of you probably won't have about the company. It's a small company founded in 2004. Uh, we're mainly working on smart sensors, sensor systems, and sensor networks um, in the area of chemical sensing. So we're coming from the chemical sensing area. A lot of our clients um, are research institutes or companies that are bringing um, chemical sensors to the market or that are developing chemical sensors. Um, so our focus really is on research and development. This uh, is a slide which shows some of the developments that we have been doing, which ranges from, you know, small plug-on modules to mo of mobile phones to um, platforms that can be easily used in research to measure um, gas sensors. Uh, Two full devices, this is a, um, a breath analyzer instrument that's used in clinical studies that we have been developing within a research project. So we are, we are working with clients, we're doing uh, bilateral projects, developing dedicated hardware for them, but we're also going into research pro uh, projects as partners uh, to, de to develop new te technologies where our role typically is the system integrator, the one that is taking the sensing element and builds a system, system around it uh, with the software, uh, with the user interface, uh, with the measurement chamber, uh, with the algorithms that will then, um, you know, uh, develop the whole application to a state where it can be sh can be shown that it's working in a practical environment. We're also working on a lot of different chemical sensor technologies, not only metal oxide sensors, which will be a little bit the focus of this talk, but we have systems for QCM sensors, saw devices, for uh, electrochemical cells, uh, for uh, nanowires, for field effect transistors. So we've been working with a huge range of different uh, sensor technologies. So we have quite a good overview of the different sensing technologies. And that's why I would like to start uh, the talk also by going through the different uh, technologies that could be suitable uh, 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 to be used inside the mobile phone area. So, um, this is um, a table, and all these tables need to be taken with a, you know, uh, with a, with a grain of salt. None of those things are 100% true. You will also always find some sensors that are more sensitive in each technology, and there are always ways to to um, uh, improve a certain technologies to, uh, towards a certain area. But in general, this is more, you know, to be seen as a as a as a comparative. Uh, um, between the different technologies that are out there. Um, so some of the more established technologies are electrochemical sensors, palisters, metal oxide semiconductors, and the optical NDIR sensors. Uh, field effect transistors, as well as mass sensitive devices and polymer sensors, um, they are still more at the research level or at the prototype level. So if we're discussing for a moment those that are really um, in, in wide industrial use, 
the electrochemical technology is technolo technology that is very often used as uh, personal safety devices. If you if you're working in a in a hazardous area, then you can you can buy these personal monitors that will uh, contain very often electrochemical cells, sometimes also combinations of electrochemical cells, pellisters, and metal oxide uh, uh, sensors. Um, but the advantage of the electrochemical cell really is that it's it's a sensor with a defined baseline. If there is no current, um, so no signal, then you should be around the uh, um, you should not have uh, the gas that you want to analyze around. So that is one of the big advantages of the electrochemical sensors. Um, um, the electrolyte, it's, it's a sensor that uses an electrolyte and a, and a redox reaction inside, and it, uh, we are measuring really the, the uh, consumption of the gas um, that is diffusing into the uh, electrochemical cell. So it's a very um, physical process because we're, uh, the, the typical way the electrochemical cell is designed is by, uh, by a diffusion-limited uh, reaction. So um, essentially, that effect makes them rather reproducible. Um, the limitation is that um, very often you experience short lifetimes. Uh, typical uh, lifetime of, a, of an electrochemical cell will be around two years. Um, and as they're often used for, for um, uh, safety applications, there's a recommended recalibration interval of, of uh, you know, a few months. Um, the advantage still is that um, they're, reproducible, uh, they're reproducible. The drift typically is in one direction, so that makes them a nice, nice uh, reliable sensor. Um, the pellister sensors actually they are, they are used to detect flammable gases, so anything that can be burned, um, which, which is essentially um, how they are measuring uh, the analyte. They're burning the analyte and they're measuring the, the heat um, transfer that comes from that, from that burning. So again, that is uh, a reproducible sensor, more like a physical sensor, but we need to burn the, uh, the, the flammable gas and they're restricted to flammable, flammable gases. Uh, the metal oxide semiconductor sensor is one that is now widely used uh, in many applications, especially if cost is a big issue, because they can be made very cheap, they can be made small. Um, one of the main applications is air quality, is carbon monoxide, so carbon monoxide gas burners. Uh, the initial application of them uh, in Japan, uh, where they um, first conquered the market, was... Um, um, City gas or or, or methane, uh, butane, propanol gases that you that you use for heating and where you need um, safety devices that will warn you when there is an increase of that kind of uh, gas around in a in a room in a closed uh, uh, apartment. So it's a safety sensor, but not with a requirement for a very high uh, resolution. Um, the presence of the gas is the warning, and you just need to make sure that if you are reaching a certain uh, level, then the sensor will uh, respond and uh, warn the inhabitants. So the limitation of those sensors are typically stability and selectivity, especially if you want to detect, detect gas in much lower concentrations, then of course uh, stability and selectivity becomes an issue because if you have a broadly selective sensor and uh, you want to pick out certain gases from, from the atmosphere, then any interfering gas will lead to changes that you have to discriminate between the gas that you want to analyze. So as we have seen in the last talk, one concept is to combine them into arrays and use several of those sensors, which on the one side is nice um, um, that you can do this. On the other side, if you want to integrate it into a mobile phone, it means you know, more cost, more space, more power consumption. So you need to, you need to balance these, these effects. Um, the other very um, established technology is the optical NDIR sensor, um, uh, which is typically used to measure CO2. There are also, um, if, you, if you set the optical uh, filter to uh, wavelengths that, that sense uh, in different areas, you can also sense different uh, analytes like methane gas, for instance. Um, but the typical application is CO2, um, where they are a perfect sensor because it's a, it's a physical sensor. Uh, you don't have an interaction between a chemical layer, which would lead to drift. Um, so it's a very reliable sensor. Um, the disadvantage of that kind of sensor is that 
you need an optical wave path. Uh, so you get this absorption effect due to the CO2 presence. And that wave path determines the sensitivity. Now, if you want to bring that into a mobile phone, there is not much space for, a, for an optical wave path. So the size constraint in that area is really something that's hitting you. Um, from the more um, uh, research-driven sensors, there are, there are these mass-sensitive sensors where what you essentially do is you have some resonating structure, and that resonating structure uh, will change its frequency depending on the amount of analyte that, uh, that absorbs from the air. Um, typically used sensors are here QCM sensors where you have a quartz crystal like you have in a watch. Um, or, or a saw device where you have a, a, a wave that uh, trans, uh, translates through the surface, um, so surface acoustic waves. Um, and if you want to integrate it into a chip, there's also a way by using cantilevers, so small swinging cantilevers that, that resonate at certain frequency, and then uh, you can measure the, the, the resonance change due to the absorption of material and the mass change on top of that resonating structure, which will reduce typically the resonance, uh, the resonant frequency. Um, so that's a nice concept. It's also um, quite reproducible if you're using um, uh, appropriate um, layers onto those sensors. Uh, the disadvantage here is often that um, you need a reference gas. Uh, why? Because uh, consider you have a sensor that operates at 30 megahertz or 100 megahertz or, or even higher, and you want to measure the, the change in, 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 resist, uh, in, in resonant frequency due to the incorporation of some extra mass onto that already massive uh, structure, um, then the change that you measure is only a few hertz. And then you have to take into account that this resonant frequency not only depends on that absorption, it also depends on other effects around, you know, pressure changes, uh, temperature changes, uh, especially temperature can change the resonant frequency quite drastically. So you're typically measuring frequency changes in the order of less than ppms or pp or even, you know, um, 100 ppb of the of the uh, resonant of the fundamental frequency of the substrate. So if you have a 30 megahertz quartz, it's very easy to measure frequency changes in the area of one, two, three, four, five hertz. Um, and uh, there's also enough uh, um, signal to noise ratio to measure those reliably. But the frequency change due to temperature and others might be 100 hertz or 500 hertz. So you need to discriminate that. And the typical way to get around it is to establish the baseline of the sensor at a certain given time by using a reference gas and then switching to the gas that you want to measure. Now on a mobile phone, where's the reference gas coming from? So that's a limitation um, that, uh, that will uh, uh, really um, lead to um, you know, uh, the, the issue that if you only want to measure very small signals as you have to establish the baseline, you're limited. So um, the, the field effect transistors that are also mentioned on that, um, on that chart they're interesting. Um, they, they have been around and they're used commercially for hydrogen detection in, in, in the case of the Lundström FRED. The Lundström FRED is a field effect transistor where you have a gate material that is porous and the, the, um, the hydrogen molecules can form an extra default layer between the gate and the sewer strain channel, which changes the work function and as a result changes the potential around the source strain channel, which you can measure as it changes current through the source strain channel. It's effectively an additional voltage onto the gate that, onto the gate that, you, that you see when, uh, when a gas is present. Um, so they've been around. They're typically heated uh, sensors to allow for the hydrogen to diffuse quicker so that you don't have too long re response times, typically in, a, in the range of 150 uh, degrees degree Celsius. Um, but if you want to measure something else than hydrogen, which might be of limited use on a mobile phone, then uh, 
you need to make that porous la layer in a way that also VOCs can go through or that you have some catalytic reaction on the surface that will produce a hydrogen that diffuses through the layer. So the whole process becomes more complicated. Um, <clears throat> one way around it is the so-called SG fed, the susp suspended gate fed, which is a more complex structure because now you're lifting the gate off the sous drain channel and you're putting a, an air channel between the, uh, the gate and the sous drain channel. So effectively, the lower side of your gate becomes the sensitive area, and you can cover that with a polymer or something else. Something else. The disadvantage in that case is that now your silicon structure becomes a lot more tricky because you have to provide this suspended gate in a way, which means two chips bonded onto each other, which makes the whole process and the packaging and the cost around it a lot more expensive. Nevertheless, there is a company that has been trying to bring that to the market. Um, it's, it's originally a technology developed by Siemens and uh, uh, a university in Munich. And uh, there is the company Micronas, which has recently bought by, oh, I forgot. Uh, so it's Micronas in, in, in um, Freiburg, who has been trying to bring this under the, the brand name MySense into the market. And I think they're also targeting the mobile phone market because apparently that's a technology that could operate at low temperature lower temperatures and it's silicon compatible. A field effect transistor is of course done on a silicon chip so you can uh, with flip chip bonding put those two chips together and bring that to the market that way. Um, they've been trying to do that for years. So far I haven't seen a product really out there in the in the field that has created a lot of uh, a lot of market but that is still something that is happening. So that's maybe one of the contenders here. Uh, um, outside the metal oxide sensor market that, that could be watched. Um, so the last one here on that list is the polymer sensor. So now this is a big, big um, um, uh, area of different sensors uh, that could be used. It could be conducting po polymers like polypyrrole. It could be um, the typical carbon black polymers that have been uh, marketed in the Serono's instruments, or it could be gold nanoparticles. The concept there is um, you either have a by itself conducting polymer or you're mixing something into the polymer which makes it um, uh, a resistive st uh, structure which provides some conductance and then you're measuring the change of conductance as a result of absorption or interaction of gas molecules with the species that you have inside the polymer. The nice, the really nice um, uh, advantage of that, uh, such kind of technology is that it's very low power. Um, you don't typically need to heat those things. It's very easy to integrate because it's just a polymer that you need to put on some kind of interfibutate structure which could also be done on a chip. So it's potentially a low cost technology. Um, often we've seen limitations in sensitivity. So let's go to the next slide where I've tried to summarize the pros and cons. Uh, of those different technologies uh, in terms of applications on a mobile phone. Um, again, it's a little bit hard or harsh to really take that. So if you are going for any kind of applica uh, application, you should really uh, look in detail. Is there a way around it? Can I make the technology work really? Because there are some, uh, sometimes ways around and there are sometimes um, um, ways to, to, um, to cope for um, you know, uh, stability issues or other issues that, that could help make a technology work. But that's a general um, uh, rough identification of the different technologies. Um, I've been a bit uh, broad in two areas here on the mass sensitive sensors and the polymer sensors because they're actually, they're dependent on a lot of different uh, properties. You know, what kind of sensitive layer are you really uh, um, looking at? Is this a, a conductive sensor, what kind of analyte material do you have? There are some analyte materials that you can't pick up with a certain technology because just fundamentally there is no interaction which provides some kind of a signal. Um, um, like if you're, if you're trying to measure oxygen changes with a mass sensitive sensor, there are, there's not really much of a change on, on the sensor because oxygen or N2 or others are in sim similar, uh, similar range. Um, um, but uh, in general, that's that's one way to look at the things. And if you look at here, you see that from a cost point of view, uh, 
from an availability point of view and from a size point of view, which are all you know extremely important uh, parameters if you want to go to the market. At the moment, only the metal oxide sensor technology is really fitting that area. This part here, I mean, that is something that we could argue here because the, especially those the, this, this MySense technology could change the picture here a bit more. Um, let's wait and, and see what happens on the market. Um, so, I would also like to, um, you know, give a, give a little bit of, of motivation why people should be going into the mobile phone market. And um, I think it's pretty obvious, actually. Uh, if you just look at the size of the market, there is no other technology market available that produces comparable numbers of units that you're going to sell. Mobile phones, if you just look at the Samsung Galaxy S4 uh, until the... Um, the first quarter of uh, 2013, I mean, you have tremendous numbers. This is These are production numbers in, in millions. So I think of the Galaxy S4, they, they've sold 40 millions. So if you put a sensor, any sensor inside there, and you have 40 million sensors, then you will have a, a market that probably exceeds almost any other market there out in the field. So of course, it's a, if you have some kind of a technology that is a mass market technology that profits from you know, shrinking the size and producing it on a silicon level in big numbers, then that is really the market that you need to conquer if you want to be the winning technology provider in that area. So that is why um, uh, the companies have really been drawn into that area. If you have another niche market with your gas sensor, then you can produce maybe, you know, 500,000 sensors, which is already for gas sensors a huge market. Gas sensors is typically a very fractured market with lots of different niche markets. Um, but if you compare that to something like this, even the automotive market is small in comparison. Um, so people are really attracted by that market. Um, so why hasn't it already happened? Well, actually, it has happened already. The Samsung Galaxy S4 had a temperature and humidity sensor inside, which essentially is a gas sensor. Um, there's even been an earlier phone in Japan in 2009, a feature phone that was delivered, uh, you know, only solely in, in, in Japan by one carrier, um, which already had a humidity sensor inside. So there is already some precedence there of chemical sensors making it into, into the mobile phone. So I think it's quite an interesting idea to look into more detail why that happened, uh, what happened there, and why the next phone didn't have one. So, <coughs> the, um, the approach that um, Sensirian uh, took to, to conquer that market was, of course, they've been shrinking the size of the, of the device. This is the, the pre-mobile phone sensor, the SHT21, and this is the, the sensor that's now in the phone, and I think it's even a little bit smaller than, than on this picture here. I tried to keep it in the same size, but the size difference is even, even a little bit stronger. Um, they've been very early contributing to the Android project to have something as a driver inside there. If you're looking into the Android source code, uh, then you will find places where you see the Sensirian, the SHT21 already mentioned, and there are uh, certain aspects in the, in the hardware mon area and in the sensing area that are really uh, designed in a way that makes it possible to enter chemical sensors. So they've been quite early in that area. <coughs> of course, at that time, Sensirian was the only company, essentially, that was providing a temperature and humidity sensor in one package with a digital interface. So that was their really differentiator between a lot of different um, humidity sensors that were already out on the market, which were typically analog sensors. So you need to place them inside, you need to calibrate them, you need, you need to add something there. So the, the advantage of the, of the Sensirian sensor was that it's pre-calibrated, it comes in there, you, you put it inside the thing, and it typically should just work. That's, that's why this sensor really has been very, very popular on the, in the humidity sensor market. Um, so, <coughs> um, in 2014, the, the S5 was released and the humidity sensor was gone. Um, what, why is that? Actually, 
Was it too expensive? Didn't it work? Well, first of all, some users complained about that performance. I mean, people have been testing the sensor and trying to find out, can I measure the humidity with it? Um, but those were really the, the technical adept uh, people. So it, it's not the broad majority that really <clears throat> does this performance testing or complains about bad performance. Typically, they take what they get there, you know, and, and believe it. Um, but actually, most users didn't know about it or didn't care. And I, I bought one of those phones because I was I, I knew that the sensor would be inside there, so I was really uh, very interested in it. So I bought one of those phones, and and at the beginning I played around with it, but then I, I found out after you know having the phone for a week or two weeks that actually there is no no much need to to know to measure the humidity with your mobile phone. So why would you do that? I mean I know if the air is dry, I know if I feel well. I don't need my phone to tell me that. <laughs> So I can sense it perfectly myself. So where's the added value? I think that is really the, the big issue that, that this kind of sensor had. <clears throat> so when the S5 was released, the sensor was gone because that value that, that is provided to the end user is, is, is just not there. But let's, let's try to... Oh, wrong direction. Let's try to dig a little bit deeper on how tech, uh, that was done technically. Um, so I, I took the, the the S4 and I ripped it apart and I looked inside to really find out what this what is happening there, where the sensor is, and and so one thing to note. So so this is the lower part of the of the mobile phone. Uh, this is a small compartment that you can lift off, which carries some antennas and and the buzzer or the uh, the, the speaker, and. Um, um, so this is the, the USB connection here, down here, and there's some cover area here, and the sensor itself is below here. So if we're lifting off that area here, we can get to the to the inner parts here, and this is the sensor here. So here's the USB uh, connector. Uh, this is an antenna, and um, or th this is an antenna cable. The antenna actually is sitting on contacts here in that compartment. And here is the here is the, the the sensor, and you will notice there is a small hole below the sensor. On the other side of that board, you will find the uh, the microphone. So they placed uh, the humidity sensor in close proximity to the microphone, and and actually um, there is a small, um, very um, tiny hole in the phone which provides the access to the microphone and the sensorium sensor. And to seal this thing, there is a small gasket here, a rubber gasket that, that seals that area that provides the access from the microphone on the other side to the temperature and humidity sensor. So that is uh, what they did to um, place the temperature and humidity sensor inside the phone. Now, if you're holding your phone and you're speaking with your friend on it and then you want to measure the temperature and the humidity, you're taking the thing out of your hand and then you're, you know, you're pushing the button and say, okay, What's the humidity level here? Okay, you've been speaking to your friend for five minutes and the humidity is going to be extremely high. <laughs> because in your breath, you have humidity almost 100% saturated at body temperature. No, that is a lot, a lot of humidity. Um, and of course, that sensor will see it. If you take that mobile phone out of your pocket, you know, which is close to your body, it sure doesn't have the ambient temperature. Uh, it also will have not the ambient humidity because in your trousers you have different humidity level just above your body, above your skin. You have higher humidity. That's absolutely normal. You, you're sweating. If you take it into your hand, you have sweat from your hand. So there are all those uh, intrinsic uh, problems that you have when using that kind of sensor inside a mobile phone that are things that you can't really get away from. The only way to measure humidity reliably with that sensor is to take the phone, activate the humidity sensor, place it somewhere where you don't touch it, go away so that you don't breathe at it, and then measure the humidity. Now, why should I do that? I know the humidity level because I know <laughs> how good it is. So that's another problem why we need to really investigate what the use case for something is. Um, so, if we're looking a little bit onto the, the minimum requirements that we need to meet when we're placing a sensor inside a mobile phone, then, um, of course, there is hardware requirements. We need to 
play well with the surrounding electronics, which typically is supplied with 1.8 volts. I mean, there are different voltages inside the phone, uh, but 1.8 volt is the standard voltage that many chips use in mobile phones. So if you're supplying, if you're using that voltage, you're on the safe side. Uh, you need to provide low power consumption. This is an add-on feature that you're going to deliver, which is not the core part of the phone. So the, the, the budget, uh, the power budget that you will have for that is low. Um, you need fast on and off cycles because the user is, I mean, if I use a phone, I know I can start an app, it is there within seconds and I can get my information and I'm good. So that's my expectation. I don't want to go, you know, for half an hour waiting until the sensor has equilibrated and then find out what's happening. Um, so you need to provide those fast on and off cycles. Um, smallest, smallest possible size is needed, of course. There is a lot of competition inside the phone, what you can put inside, and space is, of course, a big constraint. And you need a digital interface. You can't, you know, use an analog sensor and tell the phone manufacturer to build the analog interface around it. They don't have the know-how to do that. Um, they're developing phones, you know, typical phone, you know, every half year they bring out another phone. So they don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, messing around with their analog hardware. The sensors need to be digital. And you need to, you know, have the, have the software requirements already there. They, you know, it, it, it's, it's a development process that needs to be quick and fast for the phone manufacturer. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Um, specific challenges for chemical sensors and mobile phones. Well, we need to survive the production process, which means, you know, typically 250 degrees in a reflow oven if you're using an SMG sensor. Um, most chemical sensors that are out there on the market are something that you plug into the electronics once the electronics is done. Or may maybe you're soldering by hand, you know, for niche markets, uh, the sensor after the, the typical electronics design has been done. But inside a phone, there is one production process. So you, you have to live with that production process. Uh, you must survive the reliability testing. They do all sorts of strange things, you know, dropping phones, uh, salt water spraying, and there, there are lots of things that they do, vibration tests. But typically those you, you can probably manage. Um, the more uh, difficult things is that if you know gas sensors, if you know metal oxide sensors, if you know, and you know, all the typical gas sensor technologies, you know typically you need to calibrate those sensors. And we need to calibrate those sensors not inside the phone after, you know, the thing is built because you can't calibrate the phone. You can't expect the phone matcher who's churning out millions of phones um, to go with each phone into some step where it's equilibrated at some known um, calibration gas for, for half an hour. That, that's not going to work. So you need to have something that's, that's, you know, you install it there, it works, it has the calibration data with it, and it works. And you can't expect your user to go and calibrate your phone because there is this gas sensor inside that, you know, will give wrong readings if the calibration is not repeated. It's also not possible. So these are um, um, hard um, uh, requirements that, uh, that you need to meet. And then, on top of that, the mobile phone is something that's carried around, that's used outside, that's used inside, that's used in humid. Uh, environments that used in the Antarctica, that's used in, in in the desert, that's used in in Malaysia in in the monsoon time. So you know it's it's it, the the background is so vari variable uh, that you need to find ways how to make that sensor operate in these different uh, backgrounds, which is a lot more challenging. As if you have you know a gas burner that you typically you know screw to the wall, it sits there. It's at room temperature typically all of its life, and the only thing that it needs to do is when it senses something, then it needs to alarm. And that's the, the most successful application for, for metal oxide sensors at the moment. So the main challenge, however, is really, you know, what, what do we provide to the end user? Why should he use it? Why should he want to have a phone, uh, a sensor in his phone? Um, so we need a differentiating factor. So it's it's worth um, to to look at potential applications in mobile phones. So uh, this is a list of uh, typical applications that people are working on. Air quality is one important issue. Um, uh, we'll see in a minute what, what air quality really can mean. Uh, fire detection or threat warning. I think this is also a nice thing. I mean, if I have a, a phone 
and, and I'm somewhere out there and the phone can wake me up when it senses a fire around because you know the CO levels go up or hydrogen is detected or something and there's a warning signal while I'm asleep. I think that's a good application uh, for people who are traveling, who don't have a warner around. Um, then there is this health or well-being things, ketosis or halitosis or helping me to, to, to sense my, um, my, 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 my body functions to see if I'm in a good state or if I'm following a diet, if I'm not working well, you know, is, is my body working well? So this, this breath analysis uh, um, is something or breath analysis or maybe through the skin or something, that's our, that are applications that I think uh, make a lot of sense because that's something that... Um, I, as a user, have a direct effect. And I'm also prepared to work for that, to, to really to do some kind of an exercise with a phone. Or I don't expect that I switch on the phone and it tells me uh, immediately I'm OK. I'm prepared to you know, do something, breathe into the phone, you know, look uh, what the signals are, or not, not look at the signals myself, but wait for a result to be happening. Because it's value that I get. It's something that, that I'm really interacting with the phone to do something. Like you know, a breath alcohol measurement. Am, am I OK to drive? That would be nice if you could get the sensors to a state where that is reliable. But if they're not reliable, we can also, we see all those gadgets. I mean, we've built some small, I've got it here, some small plug-on module that you can plug onto your mobile phone. And one of the, 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 the big things we had with that, we had a lot of fun when we went out drinking to see who could drive that sensor to the cra craziest level. So some kind of a, more like a gadget thing, not a tool to find out if you're fit to drive, but you know things where you can use the, the sensor in your social environment or each enhance your, your, your um, uh, experience for something, that's also a good application. Um, food quality or safety issues or, or other things might also be interesting things. So it must be something that's of value to the consumer. And if we are, uh, I think we should skip over that. Um, so this is, this is a number of sensors that are now coming out to the market um, that are um, providing digital interfaces, which is different to how um, gas sensors are working so far. Typical gas sensors are analog sensors. So we have here uh, essentially um, four companies coming with products onto the market. Um, let's just go briefly. I mean, I will have another talk uh, on Wednesday where I will describe those sensors in a little bit more detail. But just quickly here, this is uh, uh, this is uh, one of the first contenders on the market, the CCS sensor. CCS has been recently acquired by AMS, who also has bought um, a flight sensor, another metal oxide sensor company. So they're trying to build a powerhouse there, especially going for the mobile phone market. And that is a very, very small sensor, which includes um, uh, a small microcontroller to drive the sensor and uh, the sensor itself. Uh, and it, to the outside, it provides an I2C interface. Um, they're all, you know, I2C interfaces. They're all 1.8 volt. They all meet those requirements for the mobile phone market. But the concepts are a little bit different here. This one here, um, as well as the IDT sensor, which is um, um, uh, Another company that's going hard into that market, they bought two companies, one in Germany um, and one, one in the U uh, US called Sintera, who has been providing metal oxide sensors for a while, and they're combi combining those to, to prevent a new sensor. And they, they, re they released that combined chip here in uh, 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 you know, a couple of months ago, in 2016, to enter the market. Uh, so that is, uh, that is a small chip. Uh, with the digital interface, again, with one metal oxide sensor here. We have also Bosch in here with a very strong contender, the BMD 680, that was also announced last year. Still not really available on the broad market, but the nice thing is it can humidity, pressure, temperature, and gas. So it's got a metal oxide sensor inside there. All of those sensors using MEMS metal oxide sensors for low power consumption and also the ability to do, um, to do temperature cycling. Uh, and then we have the Sensirian multi-pixel sensor, also Sensirian, the company who had the first temperature and humidity sensor inside the market is providing a gas sensor now. And the difference here is that they claim to have different metal oxide sensors. They call it multi-pixel because they have different sensor coatings. So they can just, they have a, a multiple of metal oxide sensors in one really small chip. The size of those chips all is comparable, you know, three by three millimeters, um, very, very tiny chips. A digital interface, uh, so it should be easy to use, very interesting chips. 
none of them really freely available on the market yet. They're all working with their dedicated, you know, high volume customer to solve the first application, their killer application to get into the market. They're all working on it. And they're all not there yet. So you can see it's quite challenging to enter that area. Um, but they've all chosen the metal oxide sensor technology. So potential applications, just quickly, air quality. Um, uh, air quality is something that is quite established for metal oxide sensors. There are plenty of those sensors out there. Air quality sensors have been around based on metal oxide sensors for many years. There are already integrated products since a couple of years. Um, there is for it, there's also low cost, high volume things. So this is a this is an air freshener that you could buy for you know six dollars in in the store, which actually includes a metal oxide sensor inside, and you can place it into your toilet. And whenever somebody has done his duty, this guy will sense it and <laughs> generate a small puff of perfume into that room. It works beautiful. It works well. I've bought one to test it. Of course, I'm really, really curious to see how to see how those things work, and I. Place it into our toilet, it works beautifully, but my wife didn't like the perfume, so it was thrown out again. But that's another, I mean, that's that's another problem. Um, the other broad application here is, for instance, in automotive uh, cars, which is similar to mobile because you're going to different environments and you're placing the sensor in front of the uh, air intake to sense the air that's coming into the car. So if there is bad air coming from the outside, then it will close the flap to prevent that air from going inside, and when the air becomes cleaner outside again, it will open it again. So that's a way of reducing the uh, pollution level inside the car. Um, and that is a standard product that is now in millions of cars, uh, mainly de uh, initially delivered by, by Bosch and Paragon, and now one of the market leaders is AMS with, the, you know, with, the, with their applied sensor branch. Um, but if we are going onto the mobile phone, um, what means mobile uh, air quality on a mobile phone? I mean, on a car, I understand that you put an air quality sensor there because the air the sensor can do something. It can, can open and close the flap. Um, if if we're talking about a mobile phone, you know, the sensor can do nothing. Okay, it could warn the person. Okay, the air quality inside here is bad. But the next problem is what is clean air, what is good air to the, to the person. And there is no single standard on air quality. Air quality is a broad field of things. It can mean toxicity, it can mean nuisances, malodors, you know, it can mean toxic gases, it can mean high CO2 levels. You know, in this room, after we've sitting, been sitting here for two hours, probably the CO2 goes up if the ventilation is not working well. And we could monitor that, monitor that with, a, with a sensor. Maybe there is one here, I don't know, it could be and then uh, they would change the ventilation control. So that is air quality, but you have something that is actionable there. On the mobile phone, it's a little more tricky what you do, what you do with that kind of information. So I'm not sure if this is going to, to, really, uh, to really help. Uh, and there's also a lot of user education that you need to do. And again, I mean, if you're taking, if you have the phone into your purse together with your perfumes or your lipstick, then you know, that, that's one of the problems that you face. Again, we have to, if you're looking at those things, we need to find out uh, what to do best. And I think that should give you a glimpse into the field of mobile phones and gas sensors and what you need to do there, the, the general problems that you do have. And, um, I would like to end it now to give you time for the coffee break.